Hello and welcome to a narrowboat DIY video. Today I am upgrading the solar setup on the boat. I put the original solar panels on only a couple of months after I bought it, so that's about five and a half years ago, and by and large they have done very well. But I'm facing my first winter without shore power, and so I decided I would put some more solar panels on the boat. I think I'll start by just doing a quick recap of what this existing setup is. What I've got there is two 240 watt Panasonic panels, thus giving me a total of 480 watts maximum theoretical output of solar power, and they are wired in parallel down to a solar charge controller. Each panel is rated at 50 volts, which translates to oh, about 5 amps, I suppose, or if you translate that down into 12 volt terms, about 20 amps at their theoretical maximum output. So together in total you've got something like a theoretical maximum of 40 amps at 12 volts, although the most I've ever actually seen them do is 33, which was on a really, really sunny summer's day. 33 amps is a fairly hefty amount of charge, and it would only take a couple of hours at that rate to give me pretty much everything I use in a day. So you might be saying, well, why do I need any more solar? Because that 33 that I saw just the once was on a very, very bright, clear summer's day. And by and large, super sunny days are pretty rare in Britain, even in the middle of summer. And certainly in spring and autumn, and definitely in winter, it is just not the case. Normally, you have weather that is a lot more like today, overcast. And yes, I know people will be going, but you still get power when it's overcast. Yes, you do, but it is much, much less than when there is clear, bright sunlight. And yes, I know I've got the panels flat and people say, well, point them at the sun. But on an overcast day, there is no sun to point at. And all the light is so diffuse, it wouldn't matter which way you pointed the panels, because the light is the same coming from any direction. And there is not a lot of that light, so the panels do not produce much power. And in winter, it is like this all the time. Overcast, rainy, miserable, there is no sunshine, not much light to speak of. The hours of daylight are shorter. In short, you do not get a lot of power from your panels, no matter which way you point them or whether you stand on one leg and pray to the gods. The simple fact is that in winter, you don't, in Britain, you don't get a lot of power out of your solar panels. So if you want more power, you need more panels. And that's what I'm going to do. So then the question becomes, where on the rest of the roof to put the panels? I could squeeze one more in here, but it wouldn't be a very big panel, and I want to have as much extra solar as I can get. I can't really put one here, because the hatch would get in the way, or it would get in the way of the solar, or the solar would get in the way of the hatch. Either way, this is not a good spot for it. And then right here, well, I've got the two um, air vents, as well as the centre line hook, which has the ropes coming off it that needs to be clear so that I can pull the boat in when I'm on lock landings or whatever. Yes, I know I don't go cruising, so that's a little bit moot point, but the point is you don't really want to obscure that with a solar panel, and there's the chimney for the stove as well. So that leaves here at the front of the boat, where notionally I store my gangplank and boat poles. Well, as you can see, I ditched the gangplank a long time ago. It's an incredibly heavy, chunky piece of wood that was also very narrow, and when it got wet, very, very slippery. So it was a terrible gangplank. I got rid of that. One of my boat poles snapped, and I've never replaced it, so that just leaves the one which can probably sit there underneath the new solar panel, or it can just go up towards the back of the boat where I'm more likely to want it and be able to reach for it. Either way, what I've got here is two and a half metres length by the width of the boat in which I can put new solar. And to that end, I have bought this, a giant 550 watt solar panel. It was most efficient to buy one giant panel. I simply couldn't make combinations of smaller panels work. So I've got one large one. And just look how big this thing is. Look how, how it is compared to those steps. Look how far down the corridor it goes. It is something like 2.1 metres by 1 point something, and it weighs 28 kilos. It is a whopper. Because that new panel is such a giant, I don't really want to mount it with just this kind of triangular bracket at either end, like I have with the old solar. I think it needs something a bit more sturdy. 
And I know right from the outset, I am not going to bother tilting this panel. It's too big and it's too much of a pain to come out every morning and tilt it one way and then tilt it another way by the evening. And also on this mooring, the sun by and large goes that way. So it doesn't matter if the panel is flat. I'm not going to be tilting it left and right. So what I want is just some decent industrial type things, brackety things, to hold it in place. And I was fortunate enough to be given these six flat chunks of steel. I just needed to turn them into L-shaped brackets to fit the shape of the boat roof. And for that, I turned, as always, to my favourite engineering implement, a large hammer. Borrowing the marina workshop for a few minutes, the plan was to carefully and precisely mould and shape the steel with loving care and precision. Incredibly, this worked far better than I'd imagined, and a quick check against the roof and a horizontal plane showed that I'd correctly shaped the ends to fit the slope of the roof. With one done, I simply repeated the process five more times, which was both good fun and a good workout. The end result was this, six good ones and one where I got a bit carried away. These were rust-treated, primed, undercoated and top-coated with the same paint I'd used on the roof a few months ago. Now they needed holes drilled top and bottom to go into the solar panel and into the roof. I have appropriate drill bits, so by taking my time, using occasional squirts of lubricating oil and starting with a small bit and working my way up, 12 6mm holes were drilled. Now to install the panel, for which I enlisted the help of Richard from the marina, who gave both a hand and some useful tips. We rested the panel on some books at the right height, then I drilled the first hole into the panel, again starting with a small pilot hole and then a 6mm hole. The bracket was bolted onto the panel just temporarily for the moment while I nipped over to the other side, clinging on for dear life in case I fell in, and did the same there. Having marked with a drill bit where the centre of the first hole in the roof needed to go, I could then drill that out. Much like the holes in the brackets, this was a process of doing it slowly and carefully and using bigger and bigger drill bits to enlarge a pilot hole. I did 3mm, then 6, then 9. Wait, why 9, I hear you ask? Because rather than drill a hole and tap a thread into it, a viewer on my camper van channel had suggested I try rivnuts, which, if you're unfamiliar, is a kind of rivet that, when squished into place, gives you a pre-made thread. And the rivnut with a 6mm thread for the bolts I was using needs a 9mm hole for the rivnut itself. With Sikaflex sealant around the hole, the rivnut was inserted and squeezed tight using a special tool which I had to buy for the occasion and that all meant the first bracket could now be, again temporarily, bolted into place. Now in theory at this point, and it's not going to be fully glued down until I've done all six of them, but in theory that one is now a reference point for all the rest. And it's bolted in, and that will now hold the panel while I measure and make all the rest. That's the theory. Once more, unto the breach, dear friends, once more or, more prosaically, to the other side of the boat again, where I drilled a similar hole over there, sicker-flexed it, and inserted another rivnut, followed by bolting the bracket in place. That meant now the panel was held securely by two brackets at this end, and I could go on to do two at the far end with confidence. I'll show you that drilling and rivnut procedure again, as I got a better angle on it here. I made a pilot hole to start, and for reference, the roof is 4mm thick steel, followed by an inch of insulation and then the cabin ceiling woodwork inside. So I needed not to drill down too enthusiastically in case I came out in the interior. All the metal chaff was cleaned up with a magnet and wiping and brushing so the chippings didn't sit and rust on the roof. I smeared Sikaflex around the hole, 
inserted the rivnut and clamped it firmly into place. I did have to make sure I bought the right type and length of rivnuts to cope with 4mm thick steel. After installing that bracket, I did the fourth one on the other side and then came back to start putting them in permanently. That meant loads of sealant around the base of the bracket, more sealant around where the bolt into the roof would go, and then it was screwed into place and tightened up. A bit more sealant for good measure, and as always, the judicious use of a finger or thumb to smooth it out around the edges. Then repeat for the rest. And what we have there is a solar panel now supported on four brackets. I've got two extra brackets to go in the middle, but I've run out of M6 bolts, so I need to go and get some more before I put those in. But the four on each corner are now screwed, glued, and properly in place, and holding the weight quite nicely. So I'm quite pleased with that, actually. That went better than I had feared. It has just gone five o'clock, and all six of the brackets, three on each side, are now in, and screwed down and glued down and sicker-flexed, and it's OK for my first attempt. Pretty pleased. It seems pretty solid. I haven't managed to actually run the cables down to the end of the boat. I ran out of bolts and had to stop for a bit of lunch, and then yada yada, it got to about half past four, and I thought, right, that'll do. But actually, not a bad day's work. Tomorrow, run the cables and maybe wire up the controllers. Good morning. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life, and I'm feeling good. The new solar panel is firmly stuck to the roof, isn't going anywhere. I've had a look at it this morning and all the mastic has dried, uh, so that's looking good. Today's job to start with is to drill the hole here, about here, where the cable is going to go from the panel and down into the engine room. One of the little troublesome issues I've got here is where exactly to put the new cable gland. This is the new one, so I'm just trying to work out where to put that. The one for the existing panels, rather discoloured by now, is here, next to the end of where the hatch is. And if we go inside, well, it comes out inside this switch panel cupboard, which you can only open so far or all the connections start pulling off. That wasn't well installed by whoever did this. Anyway, up there, you can't really see it, but that's where the existing panel wiring comes out. It's this one here, which you can't really see. But the trouble is, there's no space for me to put another cable gland next to that and still have it come out within this very thin cupboard which means that if I put it right behind that cable gland, the cable's just going to emerge rather unpleasantly from the ceiling here. What I'm going to do is put it further back so that it emerges unpleasantly from the ceiling here and drops down, because that is behind this bit of wood with all the controls on it, so it, it really won't be visible. It'll be ugly, but you won't be able to see it. And so that means that second gland is going to go there which doesn't get in the way of the centre line, doesn't get in the way of the water running down the edges of the boat, doesn't get in the way of the hatch. I think it's going to have to go there. Exactly like the earlier holes in the roof for the solar panel brackets, this was a case of slow, steady drilling. Then, unusually for me, I remembered to feed the cables through the waterproof gland box before I ran them into the boat. Then a little bit of cable tidying. I don't have a good hidden route for the wires to get to the back of the boat, but I can at least tie them together. Unfortunately, I haven't quite got enough of these black cable ties. I've got loads of white cable ties, of course, but not enough black ones. So I've tied it as best I can, and I'll go and get some more and do it a bit neater at some other point. Now, you could argue that I should have grommeted this somehow, since the cables are going through bare metal, but the sheath of the solar cable is very thick plastic itself. There's a further plastic sheath inside the outer sheath. And as you can see, I have gunged a whole load of Sikaflex down the hole, effectively making a grommet out of Sikaflex. 
So I'm quite happy with that because those cables are really not going to move. Even if you didn't sicker-flex them, they're barely going to move. But with all that on there, they are solid, so they're not going to rub against the edges of the metal. I'm quite happy about that. And as soon as that sicker has set a little bit, I can then put the cable gland properly over the top of it and sicker the whole load of that down as well. There we go, the new wires from the new panel now go into that cable gland. I haven't fully screwed those up tight yet as the Sikaflex is still curing, but I will. In fact, you can see how much Sikaflex I used because it's all coming through at the other side. I'll tidy that up at some point, but they've come through exactly where I wanted them, which is to say hidden behind that bit of wood and they will drop down straight to a solar controller which I need to install. This is where things start to get a little bit complicated. Behind me, just on the wall here, is the existing solar charge controller. There's a grey box which is the actual controller and a little meter which you can monitor things and, and set programming parameters and so on. I cannot just plug the new panel into this charge controller along with the existing panels for two reasons. Firstly, the charge controller is only rated for as much power as the existing setup is putting out. And if you over, um, if you if you put too much power into a solar charge controller, they will go up in flames. I've seen one, more than one actually. Uh, the charred remains is not a pretty sight, so you don't want to overload your charge controller. But also, the new panel is entirely different to the existing ones in terms of its power and its voltage and the amps it puts out and things like that. And so you can't just mix and match all into the same controller. Not without, I think, it may be technically feasible to wire them together, but whichever is the worst panel kind of takes over priority and drags the other ones down. And you don't want that. So not only do I need to, would I need to replace this to cope with all the new power I'm putting in, but the new panel will need a different charge controller to the two panels, which are identical, which are my old setup, if you see what I mean. One charge controller for the new panel and one charge controller for the existing panels. And the reason I don't want to just continue using this charge controller for the existing array is because once you've got two charge controllers talking to the same battery, and they, they do both plug into the same battery in parallel, you end up with the situation potentially where in the mornings and the sun starts to come up, one panel or set of panels will start to see the light and start charging the battery before the other one does. And then when that second panel starts to come online, its charge controller will look at the battery and the voltage will already be raised because the first charge controller has started charging. So the second one says, oh, look, the battery's full. I don't need to do anything, which is obviously wrong. What you want is both the charge controllers working together. So they need to talk to each other. And this charge controller, the existing one, doesn't have the means to talk to another one. I had to upgrade to a different, newer version of this charge controller in order to have two that will communicate with each other. I hope that made some kind of sense. So the first thing I need to do is take this existing charge controller off. It's only bolted to the wall with screws and it's only slightly complicated because I do still want it to carry on charging the batteries until such time as I've fully installed the new charge controller. So I'm going to undo the screws and lower it down, still all connected to everything, and just put it to the side slightly so it can carry on doing its thing while I bolt the new charge controllers to the wall. Apologies for this mostly being a shot of my shoulder. Okie dokie, I have managed to take that off the wall and as you can see from the little screen it is still working and indeed charging the battery at 4.8 amps at this moment. So that can just sit out of the way slightly while I put the new controllers and also a couple of breakers which I never had before um, on the wall. Here is the first of the two new identical solar charge controllers. It's branded here Photonic Universe, but don't be fooled, they're just the people who flog it over here. It's an EP Ever Tracer unit. The exact model is the PTR5415AN, 12 volt, uh, 50 amp it'll handle, uh, max input voltage from the solar panels 150 volts, max PV input power 625 watts. Well, the new one is 550, so that's well within spec, and the old array was 480, so that's also well within spec. So one of these for each of the arrays. 
And then there's a little box that makes the two of these talk to each other, hopefully. Another awesome bit of cinematography here, as you try to peer around me to see what's going on, but I am just holding the controllers in place as I mark where the screws need to go. Then drill the holes. And hold them in place once more, but this time as I screw them firmly onto the wall. And there you go, two new solar charge controllers on the wall. The next phase is to put this lot on the wall, which is some breakers. Those are the little black things. There's a little Bluetooth module there, appropriately coloured blue. And then the black box at the back is the parallel adapter thing that makes the controllers talk to each other. So a bit of screwing things to the wall and then wiring them all up, which I think will now happen tomorrow. It's about two minutes later and that plan has immediately come to a grinding halt as I realise I did not have any suitable screws to mount these things to the wall. They've got these giant holes in them and I need some sort of flat-headed screw bolt thing to go through. Anyway, I don't have anything suitable. got lots of little silly little screws but nothing big enough for these. Um, I might have something to mount the Bluetooth adapter. Yeah, and then this one again needs blooming big screw things which I don't have any of so I need to do a trip to the shops it is Sunday today it's half past three everywhere will be shut um, very very soon so I'm not going to venture out now uh, I will do this all tomorrow I think good night good morning it turns out that yesterday was Saturday which I didn't realize until a little while later but it meant the shops were open till later so I was able to nip out to my local DIY store to try and find some screws and they had the worst selection of screws for what I wanted they had countersunk screws for every kind of wood application you could imagine but flat-headed type of screws that you know the ones you kind of want to go in one of these terrible terrible selection so I bought these which will hopefully do the job and it does mean I can carry on putting in all these different bits this morning. Yeah they're slightly wonky. Actually do you know what? That controller is straight, that controller is very slightly wonky and the inverter is slightly wonky. Never mind. Ugh. Still pulling 7.4 amps on the old solar, which is still chugging away quite happily. they're a bit wonky but they're on but they'll serve their purpose so that's all right uh, this can go here and then this one I don't have suitable screws for it tiny little holes it's just gonna have to dangle for the moment but that's gonna go there uh, right wiring it's quite hard to show you this as I'm doing it because I'm just going to be stripping wires and things from now on. But what we've got is the new panel wiring coming down here. And we've got an end here. And we've got another end over here. There it is. Now I happen to know that this is the positive and this is the negative off the panel. And I know that because I had a look at them with my multimeter and saw which way around they were connected. The Negative is just going to go straight into the charge controller. The positive is going to go into this um, breaker and then from there up into the charge controller. Then the output of the charge controller goes through another breaker and on towards the batteries. Same system over here. Solar panels in through a breaker, into charge controller, out through a breaker, down into the batteries. And then below that you have the little device that will make the controllers talk to each other that will have a cable coming out of here up to here and then this one will chain to here and you don't plug that in right until the end because you need to do some individual configuration on the controllers using a laptop first essentially telling them that they've got different numbers so that'll be number one that'll be number two but you have to tell them what their numbers are once you've done that you can plug them into each other and into the parallel controller and when all is finally done 
that little Bluetooth box can be plugged in and it means I can monitor the whole lot from an app as long as the Bluetooth extends throughout the boat. I don't know what the range of that thing is. But the Bluetooth controller just down there, the one running off the Victron inverter, I can see that on my phone throughout the boat, so I'm hoping that little box will have the same kind of effect. Right, going to turn the camera off now while I just wire everything up. It is a little while later. There has been a stop for a cup of tea and some lunch. But we've got to the point now where... I need to disconnect the existing batteries and existing solar charge controller in order to do the final bits of wiring. What we've got here is the new panel solar coming in here, the positive into a breaker and then up into the charge controller and the negative just goes straight in and then the positive charge comes out to a breaker and that will then go down to the battery and that's what I have this red wire for. I need to make that lead up that goes from there down to, well the positive terminal's down here somewhere, and the negative, which is this one, needs to go down there to the negative of the battery. On this side, which will handle the existing panels, I've put the connectors to the breakers, and then I will need to take the existing cables off the existing solar, snip the ends off and shove them up there and onto the ends of there. And in terms of cable routing, these ones already go down that way into the corner and it turns out that piece of trim comes off. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to take the red wire and the black wire to the battery and shoot them sideways and down that same hole. But in order for that to work I need to make a tiny hole and a bit of trim down here. Which is just wood, so that's easy enough. And with that done, there's now a tiny bit more space for the extra solar cables to go down. It is an hour or so later. Chaos reigns with the miscellany of the wiring. But you'll notice down there on the left, the old solar controller. Meanwhile, in the battery bay, there is now an additional wire, a red wire going to the um, red terminal. That's from the second solar charge controller. I also replaced a wire on the existing panels that goes from the red to... there's a fuse there. The fuse is now redundant now that I've put the breakers in, but for some reason the wire from that fuse to that terminal was thinner gauge than the wire coming down from the controller, so I've replaced it with the right gauge. And then the negative is... and the extra solar negative is now over there. This dangling piece of wire is a temperature sensor which goes into the parallel controller and I've just taped that to the middle battery. So everything is wired up, but because I've got all the breakers switched off, there's neither any battery power going to the controllers, nor any solar power going to the controllers. And the first step, apparently, is to connect the controllers to the battery. So I need to switch the breakers on and see what happens. I'm a tad nervous. Slightly annoyingly, the forward controller deals with the back panels and the back controller deals with the front panels. That's just because the existing wiring from the back panels came in here and the new wiring for the front panels came in here so it made sense to do them that way. I'm going to switch on the connection to the battery to the rear controller. Hello! It's lit up! Didn't go bang. It's lit up. It's going through some sort of initialization process. At the moment the solar is still disconnected, so this is purely switching the charge controller on connected to the battery. OK, well it's saying we've got zero amps and zero kilowatts. Oh look, it's registered that the battery has charge. OK. Oh, this is quite exciting. 12.9 volts. That's about what it should be. It's been getting lots of sunshine today on the old charge controller till I unplugged it. Oh, I suppose the other thing I ought to do is switch all the boat back on again because the fridge has been off for the last hour. Hang on, let's just do that. OK, and the light just came on overhead, so that's everything back on again. I didn't again hear any bangs. That is always a positive sign. 
Shall we now switch on the battery to this charge controller? OK, I don't know if it's a coincidence that that one suddenly its screen went off, but it's still there. If I press select or something, it'll probably light up. I'm going to need to configure these. Load, select, select. I don't know really what I'm doing here. I must read the manual. Yes, it thinks it's in nighttime mode because the solar is not connected yet. All right, this one's switched on and seems OK. It's cycling through the same displays. Nothing coming in off the PV, as we know. On the battery 12.7, it's probably gone down because the fridge will have just switched on when I put everything back on, and that will be drawing the voltage down. So it was 12.9 with just these, and now 12.7 with the fridge back on again. That's about right. All right, that is all looking good. The next test is to switch the solar on, and it is sunny outside. The battery is fully charged, so this probably won't do a lot. Um, but let's switch on the rear panels. It'll probably take a few seconds to realise... Come on, wake up. To realise that it's in... Um, Oh, I tell you what, no, they're still disconnected up above. I need to go and actually plug them in. I, I disconnected them at the wire. Right, hang on. Right, I'm back and I have connected the solar. I, I tripped the switch again just to make sure it would stay off. Now let's make this light up just by pressing the enter button. Let's switch that rear panel on. Right, this should start. See it, here we go. Look, it's detected the panels. It's flashing the charging light. Oh, wow. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised. I know it's doing exactly how it's supposed to do, but I was a bit anxious. 31 volts off the... This is the panels at the back. 5 amps. Um, hang on. Battery now going up to 13 volts. Uh, there's no load out. I haven't got a load output connected off the controllers. We can ignore that. PV 42 volts, 3.7 amps at 42 volts, 13 volts into the battery, 11 amps. Wow, that's actually pre doing pretty well, especially as the sun is coming down. Right, let's try the same with the new front panel. This is now two charge controllers not talking to each other, but both connected to the same battery. Yes, it's seen the front panel. It started charging. It might be confused by the battery being at 13 volts already, but it's getting 2.7 amps at 32 volts. That's 4.6 it's going to put into the battery, I think it said there. Let's keep them both lit up so we can see what they're both doing. 24 volts on the front panel, 3.1 amps, so that's about 6 amps at 12 volts. Battery at 40, yeah, 5.2 amps off the front panel. And 5.9 coming off the rear panels. Now, the front panel is flat, of course. The two panels at the back are tilted slightly in the direction of the sun, so I'm not entirely surprised we're getting more. But that's great! That's 5 off that, and 5 or 6 off that four off that. There we go. It's about 10 amps overall. That's fantastic! All in all, and I hope I'm not jinxing things by saying this, that was a good day. I'm not going to worry about programming the controllers now and setting them up to talk to each other. I will save that pleasure for tomorrow. I'm aching from working in, in quite a cramped space here in the engine room. I think I need a nice cup of tea and uh, I'm just going to be happy for the afternoon. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with myself there. It's not often I do a, a job where I'm actually kind of happy with how it's come out. But I'm really chuffed with that one, so I'm feeling quite, quite chipper. Time for that tea. Good morning. It's the next morning. It's a nice sunny day. And I'm pleased to report that both the charge controllers are working away quite happily, even though they're not synced to each other. They're both just pulling in the power from the panels and stuffing it in the batteries. And they, they both seem to be doing a, a very happy job. 
Uh, let's have a look. That one... Da, 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 da. No, 48 volts off the front panel. And it's giving me... Hang on, it's cycling through. Two point, a miserly 2.4 amps into the battery. I think the battery is almost charged, actually, which would explain it. 3.1 amps off the rear panels. And the discrepancy, even though the forward panel is bigger but is producing less power is of course because it is flat whereas the two others are tilted slightly at the sun and as we can see the sun today that is having an appreciable difference of about 0.5 of an amp so not bad five or six amps going into the battery um, and as I say I think it is actually um, nearly full anyway I am now going to um, plug in the computer I've got my laptop here and there's some software you download from EP Ever. Only runs on a PC, but you only use it to do the initial configuration. And after that, they have an app, which I think runs on both iOS and Android. So hopefully, this should be straightforward. Hopefully. Right, that plan just immediately went to pot because the cables I've got, which are the RS45 on an RJ45... Hold on, did I say RS485? That's Yeah, RS485 on RJ45. Um, they're both RJ45 at each end, and I need one which is USB to RJ45. And I thought I'd ordered one, but I don't seem to have it. So either I didn't, or I've lost it. And either way, without that, I cannot make the computer plug into the devices. So they're going to have to do their own thing for a couple of days while I order that cable. Drat! I now have the correct lead. It's got a USB um, connector on one end, which goes into the laptop and then an RJ45 on the other end, which plugs into the controllers or the parallel controller thingy unit. So you start by plugging this into the laptop, sticking this into one of the controllers and telling it you are controller number one. Now I suspect they're both by default controller number one, so one of them won't really need telling, but I will check. Uh, so having told it you are controller number one, you then take this out, stick it into the other controller and say you are controller number two. Or conceivably you could tell it it's controller number three but that would confuse things the point is they need to have different id numbers so one and two uh, once you've done that you can either then configure them directly or plug this now into the parallel controller and plug the parallel controller into the two solar controllers so they're all hooked up but talking through the one parallel controller unit and now you can configure them and say here's what your solar settings are so you tell the controller you've got this much solar plugged into you the battery bank is this size you're on a 12 volt system you just give it all the parameters of what you're doing and having given each of them all of that they just do their thing magically and they've got um, built-in programs for things like whether you're talking to a standard lead acid battery or a gel battery but they do have a user programmable one where you can totally set all the voltages yourself um, if you've got something odd like I mean I've got lead carbon batteries and they're pretty standard in a lot of ways but they seem to be a slight hybrid between gel and lead acid so I will configure a couple of the voltage settings um, specifically. For the software go to epsolarpv.com Click on Support, then Software, and the first download is their Charge Controller for Windows for RS485 devices. It's a zip file you download, unzip, and then install. There's two bits of software in the download. One gives your PC an old-fashioned serial COM port out of the USB cable. Note, you have to plug the cable into the laptop for it to show up. Also, make sure the RS485 box is ticked. That done, you can fire up the main software, plug the cable into the solar controllers one by one, and give them their ID numbers. In my case, one and two. I'd already done the first when I recorded this, so this is me setting device ID two on the right-hand controller. You just read the existing setup and change it. So here, I read it as ID one, because that's the default, but I need this one to be two, so I change it and press Set ID. The software refers to each solar controller as a station. So for each controller, you add it here as a station using the ID number you assigned to it. I'd already added station number one while I was getting to grips with the software. So here you're seeing me add station number two and configuring all the parameters like solar panel size and battery bank and so on. Some of this info it demands that you fill in, and other bits you can leave blank.
Having added a new station, it gives you a message in Chinese, which I took to mean success. Then you chain the controllers together with an RJ45 to RJ45 cable, link one of them to the parallel controller with another such cable, and then link the controller to the laptop with the RJ45 to USB cable. Now in the software you can select which station you want to monitor, click Start Monitoring, and it shows you all the info about that charge controller. Press Stop Monitoring and change the station you want to look at, click Start Monitoring again and it shows you that one. It's a bit clunky, but it works. If you have the Bluetooth module, you can now plug that in instead of the laptop, and then use their app to view the same information. Though it doesn't seem to work with setting it, it always gives me an error. It's fine for reading though. Just before we finish, I want to share with you the most exciting bit of the entire project. Having spent hundreds of pounds on the solar panel, the controllers, the wiring, and all the bits and bobs, my favorite thing is this. It's a mop. It costs £12.99 from Amazon. And look, it extends. It's got a fully articulating head. And the mop bit is only held on by Velcro, so you can take it off and give it a wash. And what is this useful for? It's useful for wiping the panels, keeping them clean, without going over that side where all the water is, where I might fall off. This is fantastic. Thanks for watching. Cheerio.